Hello and welcome to Prairie Pulse. Coming up a little bit later in the show, we'll profile up and coming painter Andrew Stark. But first, joining me now, our guest is Doug Hamilton, the new host for Here It Now on Prairie Public's radio network. Doug, thanks for joining us today. A real pleasure, John. Doug, as, as we get started today, uh, as we always ask, uh, tell the folks a little bit about yourself. A lot of people know you, but some may not. Well, I'm from the area. I was born and raised in Detroit Lakes. Uh, my father was the co-owner of one of the two weekly newspapers in the town, so I was sort of drenched in that business from birth. Uh, we moved to Moorhead when I was 12 years old, so I went through high school in Moorhead, went to Moorhead State College and graduated from there. Then got a Bush Fellowship to attend the University of Minnesota for my Master of Fine Arts and completed that. Uh, part of that program was an internship with the Guthrie Theater, so I was a member of the acting company in the mid-70s for a couple of years. And uh, then I uh, set out on my own and discovered uh, that I had this uh, interest in broadcasting that I actually had before. I'd been on the college radio station, my older brother had been in radio for several years by that time. and uh, so I was always interested in it. I got a call from a friend of mine, a now deceased, a wonderful professor at Moorhead State by the name of Ted Larson, who told me there was a job opportunity at a, an ABC affiliate in Fargo, and I knew it well, of course, so I'm from the area. So I applied, got the job, and uh, that started 20 years in, in commercial and public broadcasting. All right, you say 20 years. Uh, uh, let's talk about, you know, you recently, I guess, semi-retired. Yes, I actually okay. uh, uh, left broadcasting in 97 and I was hired full-time at the by Minnesota State University Moorhead to do two jobs at that time. One was to run their foundation and their alumni association and the other was to provide the uh, uh, advertising and marketing and media support for the president. That ultimately got to uh, big enough so that uh, in 2002, I was full-time on the president's side of this uh, equation and so handled the advertising, marketing, public relations for the university and sat on the cabinet. A uh, very interesting experience to be in the administrative area in higher education at the time I was because it's been going through some very profound changes. Okay. And uh, I left at the end of uh, June 2011 after 14 years of wonderful experience working for two presidents and I've known four and uh, still converse with them, so that's, that's always wonderful. And I looked back at that and thought, well, maybe I'm time to do a little traveling. So I did a lot of traveling. I spent a month doing the West Coast. I did, spent a month doing the East Coast. I spent three weeks in Southeast Asia and Singapore and Vietnam and Bali, seeing things I'd always wanted to see. And uh, then I thought, well, uh, I can't travel all the time. <laughs> I need to find something else to do. And this opportunity uh, became available, and I thought, why not? This is this is uh, this is who I am in a way, <laughs> you know. Well, let's talk about that. Was it a hard decision to get back in the media after being away from it for a while? No, it wasn't. I mean, uh, I, again, I put so many years into it, and uh, a lot of it is kind of second nature to me now. It's almost instinctual. So. Uh, I think the learning curve for me, well, there's always a learning curve. I mean, we can always learn something new and l learn how to do something better, but I have that sort of base in there to build on. So I, I, I did not feel any trepidation at all. Well, so what's it been like now with your first few weeks under your belt? Oh, it's been a lot of fun. It's been wonderful. And I, I mean, the, the program has a lot of variety in it, which I crave. I mean, I'm a, I just have a wide variety of interests. I, I, I like the arts, obviously. I, I like uh, science. I love it. <laughs> I'm just crazy about it. And I like news of any kind. I, I really like the news business. Again, I was raised in it. I, I, I drench myself in it every day. I can't find out enough stuff. So uh, it's kind of a nice melding for me of all of my interests and the ability to share them. Hmm. Well, I know that uh, Ashley Thornburg is also involved with On Air Contributions and uh, we'll be doing that with you. Uh, can you talk about that relationship and how that's going? I'm really excited about it. I think she brings a, a, a different perspective, a different voice, uh, different interests, and I think the show can accommodate, obviously, I think a very diverse range of opinions and a very diverse range of uh, stories and ideas. So I look very f up forward to working with her and uh, having her in the team. And I, I love actually the whole uh, 
broadcasting thing, the piece of it that I really kind of like is the collaborative piece where we work together to build, you know, all of us bring something to the table and what ultimately happens then because of that is something that's actually <laughs> pretty nice, uh, maybe better than we could do individually. So I, I really look forward to her contribution. Uh, and I understand, of course, the, one of the producers of the show, Skip Wood. You have a history with Skip. <laughs> we so. go back 37 years. I never thought I'd say that about <laughs> anybody, uh, I mean, for heaven's sakes. But he was a producer and a, a tech guy at uh, KTHI, Channel 11, which is now KVLY. Uh, when I started in 1975, and when I moved to KXJB, the CBS affiliate at that time, and still, uh, there was an opportunity opening up there for a producer, and I thought Skip would be the perfect guy, and he was. <laughs> so I worked with him there as well. And it's just a treat to have somebody whose competence you know, whose uh, you know, curiosity is unbounded like mine is. And so it's a real pleasure. Uh, it's, uh, it's synergistic. <laughs> well, uh, now, one of the things I know uh, you're talking about with the show, uh, of course, the show's been on the air for 10 or 12 years now, mm -hmm. and but uh, I guess there is some consideration of sort of changing, revamping, looking at things. I know you and Bill Thomas and Skip Wood and even Ashley are getting together and, and talking about that. Is there anything you can kind of give us a heads up, maybe what you're looking at and thinking well, about? Well, we've had our initial meeting, and there'll probably be one or two more before we really get things uh, set in any kind of uh, cement, but I would say that we're looking at uh, uh, the topicality of the show, uh, the flow of the show, the kinds of contributions that Ashley will bring to the table, and again, they will they will change the show, uh, and I think in a very good way. Uh, we, we're talking about some production value issues, uh, not issues, but maybe some uh, some changes. I, I, at this point, I'd say it's a little early to be saying this is going to change, this is going to change, this is going to change, but I would say it's going to change because the people have changed and you know it's kind of protean it, it, it has to follow the the, the people that are uh, producing it and, and I don't mean that's because I'm a strong personality or anything like that I just I bring something different to the table Ashley brings something different to the table and I think that combination you know creates a, a new kind of alchemy if you will okay well obviously uh, here it now is uh, Monday through Friday three to four in the afternoon mm -hmm. central time uh, you know, what kind of time slot is that for, for doing radio uh, and, and reaching out to folks? Well, that's always a good question because you want to know where the audience is, what they're doing. Uh, that'd be the front edge of drive time, I suppose, and uh, mm -hmm. drive time for those folks who are not uh, uh, really acquainted that deeply with radio's uh, structure would be in the morning and the afternoon when people are in their cars going to work or coming home from work. It's a captive audience and radio really actually owns that audience and has since cars went in radios. I mean, radios went in cars is the actual <laughs> phrase there. Mm -hmm. But the point is, uh, uh, it's, I think it's a good time. It's a really good time in terms of uh, the producing schedule. I mean, uh, a lot of the news of the day has actually popped up by then, you know, and, and uh, uh, some of it has started to uh, uh, get to a mature point where you can actually uh, uh, share it with some depth and detail. And that's probably one of the places we're gonna take the show It'll be a little less, uh, you know, produced in advance and maybe a little more specific to what's happening that day than it, than it has been. But that's one of the uh, changes, it's one of the challenges, if you will, of a program that is positioned in that day part in front of all things considered on, in the radio schedule, which is a flow of news. So we need to be mindful of what we're surrounded by, what we're going into, and the audience is most important, who's listening and why. And one of the things I really look forward to in a show like this is starting that, uh, that conversation with the audience, having the feedback from them. What do you like, what do you not like? Uh, what would you like to hear about? Uh, so I, that's, that's the part that I'm really energized to get going. Well, with that said, and you said you're having preliminary uh, discussions, and so are, are, do you have a timeline out there when some of these changes might, are they going to sort of be gradual, or do you think there'll be a time when, uh, when you sort of just say, okay, here's where we're launching sort of a new look, new sound, and... Uh, well, we've been talking about that. Uh, you know, is it is it gradual? Do we incrementally just add this and that, or take away that, or this? And, or is it a relaunch? And I think we're kind of leaning toward a relaunch mm -hmm. <laughs> at this point. We'll see. Okay. <laughs> Time will tell. 
Well, well, Doug, people like I say know, have known you for a long time around here, and and but I'm going to ask you, you know, what do you think your strong suits are in in interviewing? Of course, you you've got uh, you know you're involved in the in the arts, uh, you, po politics. You usually follow pretty well, it seems like. Uh, so, talk about your areas of expertise. Well, I have a curiosity that uh, is that needs Google, <laughs> and frankly, uh, I can I, I love to research things and. There are some fantastic uh, opportunities for research now, thanks to the internet. Uh, and I mentioned Google. There are other search engines out there. And when you search, you have to use a sifter because there's a lot of stuff that comes in that isn't worth consideration. But that said, uh, I like to find out about the uh, interviews I'm going to be doing, about the subject matter, so that I don't come in totally cold, so that I can help uh, the guest perhaps communicate the core of the message better to the audience if I know a little bit about what he's about. So I, I do feel it's important that I research the topic, research the guest if that's the case, uh, so that I bring something to the table besides just wide-eyed wonder. Uh, because there, there's only so much time in a radio show, even one I think that offers uh, a, as generous amount of time for some of the topic coverage as Here It Now does. There's only so much time and you basically have to use that time as efficiently and as wisely as possible. So that's the challenge every day. Well, and obviously uh, Here It Now, at least up to this point, hadn't been sort of breaking news stories. Mm -hmm. it's, it's been more in-depth interviews and the discussions. But, but how do you feel about catering the show to, to when something big's going on? And, and uh, do you do you shift it? Uh, my not flooding happened. I mean, mm -hmm. uh, do you take issues on like that? I think so because the sh if you call a show here at now and there's something happening now that everybody wants to hear about, you better be there. Uh, so that is a good example, frankly, of when uh, a show perhaps has to break its format and do something that is really public service oriented for people who are in desperate straits at that time. And for the rest of the state that wants to know about it because they've got family or friends there or business interests or whatever. And it's just the, it, that kind of story takes over everything and properly. Uh, it, it, and so we should accommodate that. Okay. Well, let's, let's talk some about the news in North Dakota. A lot's been going on, uh, interesting times. Uh, yeah. North Dakota getting a lot of national press. Uh, about the economy, of course, with, with the oil industry and, and things like that. Do you feel this is maybe a, maybe a, almost an easy question, a good time to be a host of Here It Now and, uh, with all the news that's going on in North Dakota? Well, it certainly is interesting. It really is interesting. I, I mean, for somebody who's lived here as long as I have and seen the state go through various economic t uh, cycles, to see this tidal wave approaching from a few years off now and and it still hasn't crested is it's startling it, it really is a, a state of fewer than 700,000 people that is now the second largest oil producer in the United States of America is stunning uh, and the the wealth that that brings to the state is one thing the infrastructure stresses that it puts on the state is another thing. The influx of the population and how that affects the values and the culture of the state is another thing. So there's a, there, there are as many stories there as you can possibly imagine. So that's a rich vein, if you will, if I can use <laughs> that analogy uh, to, to uh, uh, mine here. We, we really have to uh, uh, look, be very mindful of the economic impact and the social impact of this uh, fantastic windfall. Yeah. I thought I read somewhere where they're predicting that we'll overtake Saudi Arabia, Arabia as the largest producing oil country. Well, and that's, I mean, who would have thought that in our lifetimes? Yeah, exactly. Truly. I mean, that's just wait long enough and the world changes in a really interesting way. It does. Yeah, yeah. Let's uh, talk a minute about what do you see the primary differences between working in public radio? versus commercial radio? Well, the clock is really different. Uh, and public radio, I think, is more accommodating to the conversation, to the in-depth discussion of an issue. Commercial radio is uh, driven, frankly, by commerce. It's a, it's a business that requires regular interruptions to remind people of how that program gets on the air. And I've worked in commercial radio, and I've worked on shows that have clocks that are like 18 or 21 minute hours, which means, for those of you who don't work in radio, that there are 18 or 21 minutes of commercials in an hour. And that doesn't count all of the transitions into and out of those commercials, so you're really talking about half the time is spent doing commerce, and half the time is the actual show. So 
public broadcasting. You know, we come to people every now and then and ask uh, for listener support, but it's uh, not nearly the time commitment uh, to interrupt the program flow that the commercial broadcaster has to deal with. They both, we both do, I think, very important work. We both serve audiences that, uh, that really are interested in what, what's offered, but I honestly think that for me, uh, the more comfortable uh, area is public radio. Well, with that said, let's just talk about the industry itself, I guess, public or commercial, when, when I think about this. But how has radio changed over the years? Obviously, you've been around it yeah. for a long time. And uh, so how has it changed? And maybe, maybe a little bit of uh, crystal ball, where do you see Prairie Public in the landscape going forward? Well, I'm actually very interested in what's happening in the uh, media landscape and broadcasting in particular. And, and a few years ago, I was actually invited to Lincoln, England. There's a university there that Minnesota State Moorhead has an association with in communication arts. And I gave a, a lecture on how I thought the media was going to change in England based on what I'd seen in the United States. It wasn't terribly well received because the BBC is, uh, is frankly, uh, the gold standard in, in the United Kingdom. People pay a tax. They, when they buy a radio or a TV set, they also pay an additional tax. So uh, they're, they're, there's a lot of support for the BBC, and some of it, of course, is grudging because it's a, it's a tax-supported enterprise. But now my argument was broadcasting is kind of splintering into lots of different things because we have this Internet piece there. You can actually put your radio show on the Internet, as we do, you can put your TV show on the internet. Uh, the distribution piece of the business is drastically changing. Why spend thousands of dollars a month to shoot electrons up a stick and irradiate an area to put a, uh, in a good way, <laughs> to put a signal out, when you can have people use their own device, their own Wi-Fi or their own 4G connection to get the same thing. So I, that's what's happening out there. And I think uh, we're in this, uh, phase right now where broadcasting, uh, what we call radio, might actually be coming to us from something very different ten years from now. It might not all be coming from a stick that's a transmitter. TV, the same thing. The distribution process is changing and I, and I frankly the challenge is going to be for public and commercial uh, broadcasters to make this change uh, and to go where the audience is going. Hmm. Well, uh, Doug, in your career, you've talked about you've uh, been in it, uh, TV and radio side. Uh, what are some of the highlights, maybe some of the, uh, some, one of the big stories that you've uh, kind of stand out in your mind? Well, I was reminded uh, earlier this week that I was in the newsroom when Jacob Wetterling disappeared, uh, the 11-year-old the boy from uh, Minnesota who uh, has been the subject of a search for decades since. I was in San Francisco in 1989 when the earthquake hit, uh, and I reported live uh, from the Marina District where all those uh, uh, homes were crushed and where the fire was. Uh, I was uh, up at uh, Lake of the Woods when that Bombardier uh, sled went through the ice with, I think, four or five people, uh, none of whom survived, of course. I've covered uh, mass murders, major fires, uh, significant criminal incidents, the Gordon Call manhunt in North mm -hmm. Dakota. We were the ABC uh, base for that. And I was out in Montana uh, for a week uh, back in the 90s when the uh, uh, Montana Freemen were holding off uh, federal officials from their ranch land uh, outside of Garfield. And that was an interesting experience, uh, seeing how the national media and the local or regional media differed in how they covered an event. So I've been around an awful lot of large stories. It's hard not to have been. Well, don't have a lot of time left, but what's the main differences in interviewing on radio versus TV? Well, in radio you're not seen, <laughs> so you can maybe do a little more business uh, as long as it doesn't distract the guest than you can on TV. Uh, I think in my experience, because of the kind of TV I did, which was half-hour news programs and occasionally a live uh, long-form uh, documentary or something like that, that the time element was more severe in television than it was in radio. So I like the advantage of time.
Okay. Well, Doug, we're almost out of time here. I'm sorry for that. But if people want more information, where's the best place for them to go? PrairiePublic.org, as you know, John. <laughs> PrairiePublic.org. Well, that makes it easy. Doug, thanks so much for joining us today, and we look forward to the new uh, sound on Hear It Now. Well, it's always a pleasure. Thank right. you. Thank you, sir. Stay tuned for more. Andrew Stark is a young and emerging artist in the Fargo-Moorhead area. He studied art at Minnesota State University, Moorhead. And Andrew's art is starting to gain momentum and be displayed in shows and galleries all over the region. Here's a profile of Andrew Stark. Trying to create some kind of spiritual moment with painting, that's my ultimate goal. It really started with uh, with being, uh, you know, th uh, five years old and, and drawing and, and you know, drawing at the the kitchen table with my father. My parents were always very encouraging of my artwork, always encouraging me to draw as much as possible. Once I got to college, I decided to take some art classes, and I really fell in love with painting. I loved that working method, the experience of painting, and kind of the meditative qualities of it. I'm very influenced by the abstract expressionists. I always found I loved more of an expressive, kind of action experience oriented kind of style as opposed to a highly realistic. I consider myself a colorist and in terms of the process, it's all about the responding to the mark. Drawing has been very influential in terms of putting a mark down, responding to that mark, trying to understand or design the chaos that you create and make order out of it. The process of being in the studio at MSUM and working and getting feedback from professors, from fellow students, colleagues, that I, I think is kind of where you start to really gauge your work. You can look at it objectively, you start to understand how the viewer responds to it. You develop, you know, conceptually develop the material, the technique. I remember that first step was, was very, um, very daunting. You're putting your work out there to be uh, judged. But I had a very good reception early on. I got into uh, the Underbrush Gallery right away after my BFA show. So those experiences really allow you to start to get the desire to show work. My paintings are very influenced by my mood. Um, I think they're, they're evocative of, of different moods. The viewer is always going to take something away from a painting that I don't anticipate or, or expect, and, and I have to take that into consideration. My intent is more that it creates some kind of emotional response with a person. All of my paintings are, are kind of interior and exterior, not only um, influenced by the outside, but you know, my own um, inner thoughts and moods and feelings, and trying to evoke a feeling in that sense. Knowing when you're done is always difficult. My mentor, Zimmy Guan, used to say, a painter is never finished, you know, the, the, the painting is never done. Or the, the artist is never happy with, with, the, with the result, you know, it's always a constant struggle. I tend to work on four or five paintings at once, and so I'm kind of always rotating. When I'll get stuck, I'll move on to something else and come back. So, uh, you know, it can take weeks, it can take months, you know, I have some paintings that I haven't been happy with over the course of a year or two. I come back to it and something will happen. It's difficult to find that stopping point. There's a feeling I have when it feels complete. Um, at least it, it, it becomes, in my mind, uh, uh, really set in its, in its own uh, objectness. Once the work for me is completed, it's done and I, and I need to move on. I've had to supplement my income. That's part of the, the struggle. I've, I've, I feel like I've been extremely lucky in, in you know, being able to uh, get into galleries, uh, you know, such as Eche, and you know, have an opportunity to, to show my work and to sell work. But it is hard. I mean, it's difficult as a career. Um, but you know, going going into it and, and deciding to get my bachelor's and then ultimately my, my master's of fine art, I knew that uh, this was the path I, I wanted to take. This was my passion. It keeps you coming back, and so far it's been very re rewarding. You know, the community, especially downtown, is, is very arts, uh, pro uh, and arts supportive. 
it's very inspirational for me and it gives me a sense of, of, of peace. Arts often have uh, a lot of difficulty in terms of support, but, but I, you know, I think there's always room for improvement. Follow your passion, do what you love. Don't be afraid to take risks. One of the biggest lessons that I learned while in school was, um, and, and especially with painting, was um, not um, being afraid to fail in terms of my work. Always pushing forward, experimenting, exploring, trying as many uh, techniques as possible, trying as, as, you know, as many things as, as you can and to really uh, you know, carve out uh, where you want to go. Well, that's all we have on Prairie Pulse for this week. And as always, thanks for watching. Funding for Minnesota Legacy Programs are provided by a grant from the Minnesota Arts and Cultural Heritage Fund with money from the vote of the people of Minnesota on November 4, 2008 and by the members of Prairie Public.